Hello everyone, this is uh, Jeff at uh, Mississippi and the Civil War. It's July of uh, 2021, which marks the 158th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. There were a lot of Mississippians uh, that fought at the Battle of Gettysburg uh, because there were a lot of Mississippians in the Army of Northern Virginia. I think during the course of the war, Mississippi uh, sent almost 15,000 uh, men to serve in uh, the Eastern Army. And uh, they were some tough fighters. They, uh, they fought in some of the best brigades of the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, Barksdale's and Humphrey's Brigades, Posey's Brigade, uh, Joseph Davis's Brigade. All of them saw a lot of action at uh, Gettysburg. But tonight I'm going to focus in specifically on uh, the 21st Mississippi Infantry, which was part of Barksdale's Brigade. They did their fighting at Gettysburg primarily in the Peach Orchard, which you can see here in a modern photo of the, the Gettysburg battlefield. And uh, I just want to uh, give a little in-depth uh, um, accounting of what happened to the men who got either killed or wounded uh, in the fighting at the Peach Orchard. And I'm going to begin this, uh, this little talk with uh, a quote from a newspaper article that was published in the Clarion Ledger in October 1886. And it was a letter written by Colonel W.D. Holder, who was former commander of the 17th Mississippi Infantry, to John S. McNeely, uh, who had been a private in the 21st Mississippi Infantry. And Holder spoke in his letter about uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, and in particular the part played by Barksdale's uh, brigade, to which both the 17th and the 21st Mississippi Infantry Regiments belonged. And uh, Holter, Holder really had a lot of admiration for the fighting done by his brigade at Gettysburg, which um, is very apparent in his letter. And he said uh, in his letter to McNeely, Barksdale's brigade in line of battle on the day in question stood thus. Extreme left, 13th Mississippi Regiment, Colonel Carter, 17th, Colonel Holder, 18th, Colonel Griffin, 21st, Colonel Humphreys. Colonel Griffin was wounded in the leg, Colonel Carter was killed on the field, and General Barksdale fell in the midst of his gallant old 13th Regiment. He always gravitated to his beloved regiment in every battle. I regret that I cannot name the color bearer who signalized himself at the Trossel House which is actually shown in this period picture here. This is the Trossel House, and all of these horses were killed during the battle. In fact, they were mostly killed by members of the 21st Mississippi. But uh, no color bearer of that gallant brigade could be other than a hero. The prerequisites were every inch a soldier and equal to any emergency. They dared to go where duty called and knew by the crucial test of many an ensanguined field that their regiments would stand by them to the bitter end. And these are the kind of feelings that uh, uh, the Battle at Gettysburg really uh, uh, left in the men who participated in that fight. And you see a lot of casualty figures thrown out for the Battle of Gettysburg and for all Civil War battles. But I want to really want to bring home uh, the human face of those casualties. These weren't just numbers on a, on a casualty list. These were men that had families and loved ones uh, that were uh, left behind. And uh, their, their death or their, their being wounded really had a huge impact on, on those back at home. And uh, that's my goal with this talk is just to uh, um, show that these were more than just numbers on a casualty report. Uh, these were men, and, and uh, some of them uh, uh, died on this battlefield. Others uh, were, were crippled or wounded for life. And uh, I just want to tell you some of their stories. And I'm going to break these down by company. And I'm going to start with Company A, uh, the Volunteer Southerns, which were organized in Vicksburg, Warren County. Uh, shown in the picture here is their battle flag, uh, which uh, is on display at the Old Courthouse Museum in Vicksburg. If you've never been there, I highly recommend that you go. It is an excellent museum. And the first person I'm going to talk about uh, who was a casualty at the Battle of Gettysburg from the Volunteer Southerns is Sergeant John Marshall Collier. He was 27 years old. He was wounded on July 2, 1863. If you look in this inset picture, he is the young man seated on the left. 
this picture was taken right after the war ended. Uh, a group of the volunteer Southerns uh, wanted to have their picture taken with their old flag. Uh, they couldn't wear uniforms because they were in occupied uh, Vicksburg, so they just wore uh, gray pants and, and a plain shirt. But uh, they wanted to, to uh, uh, immortalize themselves with their old battle flag. And the only two that are identified are John Marshall Collier, who is seated there on the left, and then the man standing with the flag in the center is Austin Trescott. But uh, Mar John Marshall Collier was wounded uh, on July 2nd, 1863. Uh, he survived his wound and returned to the 21st Mississippi, serving until the very end of the war. Uh, in fact, he was captured at Harper's Farm, uh, Virginia, on April 6th, 1865. But uh, he survived a, a very short uh, time of imprisonment, uh, went back to Vicksburg, and lived out the rest of his life there. When he died in 1898, uh, one of his old comrades in the Volunteer Southerns, uh, Roswell Valentine Booth, said of him, quote, In all relations of life, he was a most exemplary man, but that characteristic which seemed to me the, to most dominate his nature was his deep sense of duty an honest and earnest desire to truly perform all his obligations which devolved upon him wherever he might be or by whomever or, or by whatsoever circumstances surrounded. And uh, that obituary is from the Vicksburg Herald, April 16, 1898. And there's one other uh, casualty that uh, I wanted to talk about from the uh, Volunteer Southerns, and that is Walter W. Wolcott. And you'll see his uh, his uh, gray right here. And you might think uh, he's buried either you know somewhere on the battlefield or in a near, uh, cemetery in Richmond or in, in Vicksburg, but no, he is actually buried in New York because uh, some of the men fighting in the 21st Mississippi at Gettysburg were northern born and uh, literally had to break with their families when they decided to fight for the South. And a, a good example is Walter W. Wolcott. He was born in Starkey, New York, uh, and I found the following uh, information about him in a history of uh, Yates County, New York, which is where he grew up. And it says, uh, Walter Wolcott, Jr., the third son of Dr. Wolcott, was born in Starkey in 1827. He was educated at the common schools and at Starkey uh, Seminary and was afterwards a bookkeeper in Rochester, New York, and St. Louis, Missouri, and a merchant in Rodney and at Vicksburg, Mississippi. At the outbreak of the war, he enlisted in the Rebel Army and held the rank of lieutenant in the Vicksburg Volunteer Southerns. In Longstreet's terrible charge at Gettysburg, he was slain. All accounts describe him as a brave man, leading his men with undaunted courage on that bloody field. He was remarkable as a mathematical student and an accomplished violin player. And uh, I I think this really, I mean, is the kind of the brother against brother. Uh, he had really had to turn against his family. But, you know, even though that uh, he fought against uh, uh, his own family, uh, after he died, uh, his family still wanted his body back. And uh, they took him back to New York, and he is buried in a cemetery in his hometown. Uh, one of the one of the few uh, members of the 21st Mississippi to be buried uh, uh, in the North that, that wasn't a, a prisoner of war. But uh, he's a he, he's a long way from uh, Vicksburg. But uh, he was uh, he was a Mississippian by uh, by choice. Uh, now I'm going to skip to the next company in the 21st Mississippi because I, I I would love to tell you the stories of every single person that was a casualty, but there were so many that I can't tell them all and and keep this to a reasonable length. So I'm just picking a few representative examples from each company. And I've got to skip to Company C now because by the time of Gettysburg, Vicksburg did not have a Company B. Um, in early 1861, uh, they were asked to give up a company uh, to, to the uh, newly forming 48th Mississippi Infantry, and uh, so they gave them Company B. And so uh, the uh, 21st Mississippi skips from Company A to Company C, and uh, Company C was known as the Stevens Rifles. And the person I'm going to tell you about was Elias B. Goldman, uh, who is shown in this inset picture here from uh, Finder Gray. This is a post-war picture, probably taken when he was, I would say, in his 40s or 50s. And uh, the illustration is of uh, 
uh, the third uh, Michigan Infantry Monument, which is near the Peach Orchard, where the 21st Mississippi fought. And uh, Elias B. Goldman was uh, 19 years old, and he was wounded in the head on July 2nd, 1863, in the fighting at the Peach Orchard. And it was very common uh, in the 21st Mississippi, and in fact in just about every Civil War unit, north or south, to have uh, kinfolk fighting side by side in the same company in the same regiment. And this certainly happened with the 21st Mississippi at uh, Gettysburg. And a good example is Private Elias B. Goldman. Uh, he had fighting at his side his brother, Corporal Henry Ithamer Goldman. Uh, and both of them were wounded at the Peach Orchard. Uh, and they were both very lucky because they both survived their wounds. Now they had two other brothers uh, that were not as fortunate. Their brother, John Harrison Goldman, uh, died of congested fever in 1861 while serving in the 18th Mississippi Infantry, which was also part of Barksdale's brigade. And then their other brother, Josiah Goldman, was a member of the 12th Mississippi Infantry, and uh, he was killed in 1862 at the Battle of Seven Pines. And uh, that's one of the terrible things about uh, this war is that it, it took such a toll on families, and particularly where you had multiple family members serving in the same company, if that company uh, got hit hard in a battle, I mean, it was not uncommon for multiple family members to be killed or wounded. And that was just a fact of life. But it had to be deeply upsetting for the family members back at home when they started hearing, you know, uh, that a new battle had happened and they were waiting for the casualty list to be, to, to be announced. Now, the next company in the 21st Mississippi was Company D, the Jeff Davis Guards, that were organized in Woodville, uh, Wilkinson County. And as I mentioned before, uh, you, when you had multiple family members serving in the same unit, uh, you always ran the risk of having uh, more than one family member killed in the same battle. And there was a good example of this in the Jeff Davis Guards. Uh, brothers Lemuel and uh, William Glass of uh, Wilkinson County were both in the Jeff Davis Guards. They were both killed on uh, July 2nd. These uh, Statement of Service cards are, are from their, their compiled service records, and they both indicate uh, that they were killed uh, July 2nd at Gettysburg. Uh, Lemuel was 21 years old, and uh, William was 26. And uh, unfortunately, this, is, this sort of thing was not uncommon. When you had multiple family members in the same unit, that was always a risk you were going to run. And uh, this is a period map uh, showing the Gettysburg battlefield. You can see right toward the center here, the Peach Orchard, where the 21st Mississippi uh, was engaged. And that's where uh, these two young men would have been killed. And the next company in the 21st was Company E. And they were also from uh, Wilkinson County. They were known as the Hurricane Rifles. And uh, the casualty I wanted to talk about was Captain Isaac Davis Stamps, who's shown in this inset picture here. He was uh, the nephew of President Jefferson Davis, and he was son-in-law of Colonel Benjamin Humphreys, uh, who would become commander of the, or who was commander of the 21st Mississippi, and would become commander of the entire uh, Mississippi Brigade uh, after the death of William Barksdale at Gettysburg. But uh, he was the uh, husband of Mary Humphrey Stamps, and she had made a promise to Isaac when he left for the war <coughs> that if he was killed, she would have his body brought back and buried in the family cemetery. Uh, at the family plantation, which was Rosemont in Wilkinson County. And after his death uh, at Gettysburg, she was able to use her political connections to have his body brought uh, from Gettysburg to Richmond during the war. Uh, she had her husband's body loaded onto a train, and they started uh, the sad journey back to Mississippi. Uh, when they got to uh, a spot near Montgomery, Alabama, the tracks had been torn up by Union Raiders, uh, so they ended up having to hire a wagon. And uh, Mary, M Mary Montgomery and uh, a driver took the body back uh, to Mississippi on a, a wagon all the way from Montgomery back to Woodville. And it's it said that uh, during the journey, some, some nights she would sleep in the wagon next to her husband's body. Uh, I just can't imagine what that must have been like. That must have been one just unbelievable trip. 
but uh, she kept her promise. She got him back uh, to Rosemont, and he was buried in the Davis Family Cemetery. In fact, this is a picture of that cemetery taken in the 1930s, and he, he is buried there today. And if you ever go to Rosemont, uh, they have on display the sword he was carrying uh, when he was killed at Gettysburg. And the next company at, of the 21st was Company F, the Tallahatchie Rifles, from Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. And uh, the individual I'm going to talk about from this company was Captain Henry Harper Simmons. Uh, the service records didn't list his age, uh, but he was wounded in action and captured on July 2nd, uh, and he had to have his left leg amputated. And uh, despite uh, having his leg amputated uh, uh, due to his wound, uh, he, was, he did survive. He was sent to Point Lookout uh, Prisoner of War Camp, which is shown in this illustration here. But uh, he didn't let uh, having an amputated leg slow him down. Uh, after, uh, after the war, he moved to Texas and died at the age of 85 in 1923. And I uh, wanted to show you this. Uh, this piece of paperwork is from his service record. And this is uh, a, uh, a uh, request to the Confederate government after he, he was exchanged. Uh, he requested that the government provide him with an artificial leg because he had lost his uh, original one at Gettysburg. And uh, the government of the Confederacy was uh, uh, going to have to provide a lot of uh, artificial limbs for veterans because there were so many that lost an arm or lost a leg. Um, the mini balls of the time, those soft lead bullets, did so much damage to a bone if they struck them. Really, the best chance of saving the, the soldier's life if they if they had an arm bone or a leg bone shattered was was a quick amputation. So, uh, veterans missing an arm or missing a leg were that was a very common sight in the post-war South. But uh, when Captain Simmons died uh, in 1923, his obituary uh, noted his Civil War service and it said of him. Captain Simmons was one of the first to respond to the call of the South, going out with Barksdale's Brigade, 21st Mississippi Infantry, Company F, Tallahatchie Rifles. He served with Lee and Longstreet in Virginia and Maryland, and was in all the battles that his glorious brigade participated in from Virginia to Gettysburg. At Gettysburg, in the second day's charge on Peach Orchard Hill, and uh, this was a little bit of an error. Uh, the Peach Orchard was uh, very flat. It was not uh, a hill by any means. But uh, uh, leading his men as captain of Company F under Colonel Humphreys, he fell, and it was thought mortally wounded. He was captured by the federal troops, was imprisoned at Fort uh, Fort Henry, or Fort McHenry, and and Point Lookout, where he remained a prisoner for eight months, and being a cripple for life, having lost his left leg in battle. And Captain Simmons was another uh, individual who had a relative serving in his uh, company with him. His brother was Corporal James Lawrence Simmons, and he was captured on July 4th, 1863 at Gettysburg because he volunteered to stay behind and help tended the wounded who were too badly injured to be moved. And uh, James Simmons uh, was a doctor by profession, so it makes sense that he would stay behind since he did have medical training. But I really can't help thinking that uh, part of his decision to stay behind was predicated on the fact that his own brother had been very badly wounded and he wanted to try and take care of him as best he could. But uh, Corporal Simmons uh, was uh, sent to uh, Point Lookout Prisoner of War Camp and uh, he was uh, exchanged in February of 1865. Now, the next company I'm going to talk about is Company G, the Madison Guards, organized at Canton in Madison County. And uh, the soldier I wanted to tell you about from this company is Alexander G. Stewart. And uh, some of the men in the 21st Mississippi weren't even men. They were boys. And Albert G. Stewart is a good example. He first enlisted in the 21st Mississippi in March of 1862 when he was 13 years old. He was discharged a month later for being underage, but apparently he didn't let this discourage him because he did somehow make his way back to the unit, uh, was enlisted, and he was present uh, at the regiment's first battle of Savage Station, Virginia in June of 1862. But uh, 
he was uh, 15 at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, and he was wounded in the side on uh, July 2nd, 1863. In fact, uh, this is the card from his service record uh, showing that uh, he was born in the state of Mississippi. His occupation was student. Uh, his residence was at uh, Fannin, Mississippi. Uh, he enlisted at the age of 13. Uh, he was single. And uh, it shows he was discharged April 62 for being under 18. But uh, apparently that didn't take because he, uh, he made his way back to the regiment. And uh, he wouldn't have been the only boy under 18 in the 21st Mississippi. There were a number of others. And particularly as the war went on, uh, the South started using younger and younger men and boys uh, just because they were running out of manpower. But uh, this image here, again, is a nice period map of Gettysburg. In fact, you can see marked on here uh, the spot where General Barksdale was killed. This is the area where the, uh, the 21st Mississippi was fighting around uh, the Peach Orchard. Now, the next company I'm going to talk about is the Warren Volunteers, Company H uh, that was organized at Bovina in Warren County. And the soldier I'm going to tell you about is Private Robert W. Fox, who was age 19. He was wounded July 2nd, 1863, and had to have his left thumb amputated. Uh, Private Fox uh, survived his Gettysburg wound, <coughs> and despite having his thumb amputated, returned to the unit and was wounded again at the Battle of Spotsylvania in uh, May of 1864. And uh, later that same year, he received his third wound uh, in some skirmishing on September 26, 1864. Uh, despite being wounded for the third time, he again survived his wounds. But uh, interesting little story about uh, Fox. Uh, he was the son of James Angel Fox, shown in this inset picture here. He was an Episcopal, Episcopal minister in Vicksburg, and he was also a very outspoken Unionist. Uh, despite his own Unionist uh, uh, proclivities, uh, his uh, son uh, became a uh, Confederate soldier, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. Even though his own son was a, a Confederate soldier, uh, in the uh, December of 1863, uh, the Union Occupation Authorities at Vicksburg called on Reverend Fox to make the traditional blessing of the United States uh, and its president, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Fox uh, uh, did make this, uh, this blessing at Christ Church in Vicksburg, and this is a modern picture of Christ Church. But when he gave the, uh, the blessing, there were several local ladies that stood up and walked out. And uh, because uh, they were just so offended by uh, Fox doing this. And uh, this caused the Union Occupation Authorities to uh, arrest those women and to actually banish them from the city of Vicksburg. Now the next company in the 21st Mississippi was Company I, the Sunflower Guards. And this was a company that uh, was actually organized by Benjamin Humphreys who, went on, who was its first captain and went on to become colonel of the 21st Mississippi and then uh, a commander of uh, the entire brigade of Mississippians after the death of William Barksdale. But uh, the person I want to talk about is Captain uh, Tully Stewart Gibson, age 30, who was wounded in the thigh on July 2nd, 1863. And some of the men who fought at, at Gettysburg that survived uh, were able to put the war behind them uh, in the, uh, when the war ended. Uh, Tully S. Gibson was not one of those people. Um, on May 7, 1865, uh, uh, just after the war ended, he wrote to his former commander, Benjamin G. Humphreys, uh, a letter, and he shared his thoughts on the end of the war. And this is what uh, Tully Gibson said. He wrote, Yours of the fifth instant was received this morning confirming what I had already heard of the sadly humiliating condition of our country. I find but little comfort in the conviction that we were right and that I did my best. My opinion that is that it is better to have fought and lost than to never have fought at all. Barnes, Dave, and Ben with their contemporaries will renew the struggle, and I trust succeed if we do not in our day. I am anxious to get into a country where Yankees cannot ride about in peace, comfort, and safety. And uh, 
Gibson was as good as his word. Uh, he gave the Yankees plenty of trouble in the Reconstruction period. He was involved in the Reconstruction riots that took place in Sunflower County, and on January 1st, 1870, the Deputy Sheriff of Sunflower County, along with a uh, group of soldiers from the 16th United States Infantry, went to uh, Tully Gibson's home to try and arrest him. Uh, the good doctor uh, refused uh, to be arrested and decided to uh, go out in a hail of gunfire. In the ensuing gun battle, uh, Tully S. Gibson was killed, and uh, the Weekly Clarion said in his obituary, quote, uh, he was with the regiment at Yorktown, at Seven Pines, at Chickahominy, at Malvern Hill, at Harper's Ferry, at Sharpsburg, at First and Second Fredericksburg, and at Gettysburg, where he was disabled for life. He never missed a march or a duty that his company was called upon to perform, and he thought he might at any time have been appointed surgeon and have been detailed for hospital duties, but he preferred to share the hardships and dangers of those who had gone to Virginia with, uh, from his beloved native Mississippi. Now, the next company uh, in the 21st Mississippi was Company K, the New Albany Grays, uh, organized at New Albany and what was then uh, Pontotoc County, what is today uh, part of Union County. And some of the, the men in the 21st Mississippi were simply listed as missing after the Battle of Gettysburg. They were probably killed on the field of battle or died uh, in the days uh, after the battle in, in some field hospital. But uh, word of, of the fate of these men never made it back to the families, and they would uh, never know what had happened to them. And there's two examples of this in Company K. Uh, Private Wiley D. Baker, uh, age 31, uh, missing in action, July 2nd, 1863. It just simply says in his service record, uh, supposed to have been killed. Uh, also in, in uh, the New Albany Grays, uh, Private David C. Crawford, age 19, uh, wounded July 2nd, 1863 missing in action. And again, in his service record, it simply says, uh, supposed killed. And I chose for the illustration here, uh, this is a picture of Charles Rudolph Martin on the left and Alfred B. Jarvis on the right, standing with the flag of the New Albany Grays. Uh, the, uh, Martin and Jarvis were the last two surviving members of Company K. Uh, Martin was 16 years old and Jarvis was 17 uh, when they joined uh, the 21st Mississippi Infantry. And then the final company in the 21st was Company L. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, the 21st had dropped Company B uh, and allowed them to be uh, transferred to the 48th Mississippi Infantry. Well, they still needed a 10th company, so they ended up uh, picking up a Company L, uh, the Vicksburg Confederates, organized at Vicksburg in Warren County. And many soldiers in the Battle of Gettysburg, including members of the 21st, were killed or wounded by the powerful Union artillery that uh, was used in the battle. And there's a couple of good examples of this in, uh, in Company L. Uh, Sergeant William Henderson uh, was killed July 2nd, 1863. His uh, uh, service record noted that, quote, he was struck by the same shell that hit Lieutenant Simmons and James Worley. Uh, Private James Worley, who was uh, uh, just mentioned, was also killed. Uh, Lieutenant Henry H. Simmons of uh, the Vicksburg Confederates was the only man of those three to survive. He was wounded and had to be left on the field where he was captured by the uh, Union authorities, but he did survive his wounds, although he was never able to return to the, to the regiment. And uh, this picture here just shows some of the uh, artillery on the battlefield. Uh, this is, I believe, the Rhode Island Artillery uh, Battery E uh, in the uh, Gettysburg National Battlefield, but uh, Civil War artillery was a great killer on the battlefields. When used properly, it was extremely deadly uh, against the uh, massed formations of, uh, of troops that they tended to use during the Civil War. And this is just a few of the men that uh, that died uh, in the in the 21st Mississippi uh, in the in the fight at Gettysburg. Uh, and shown here in this illustration, this is not a member, uh, not a, uh, a, or not a uh, monument to Barksdale's Brigade, to the 11th Mississippi, but it's just a really cool monument, so I wanted to use it uh, if I could. And uh, the, 
And this list of casualties is just one battle. This is, you know, the, the Battle of Gettysburg. There would have been a list like this and stories like these for every battle that the 21st was involved in. At Gettysburg, uh, the 21st Mississippi had 32 men killed and 106 wounded. It was uh, their worst battle in terms of casualties of the entire war. And they, but they would have had a, a list like this for every battle they were in. And they were in over a dozen battles. And uh, I can only imagine what it must have been like for the, the family members of, of the men of the 21st waiting at home, hearing that a major battle had taken place and not knowing whether their, their loved ones were alive or dead and, and probably waiting for weeks if not months uh, before an official casualty report was released. And uh, even then, uh, you couldn't always guarantee they were accurate. And then uh, you had the special hell of uh, those that uh, had family members that were just listed as missing and you, you just didn't know. And uh, you see years after the war, people putting ads in papers uh, asking for information about their loved ones that, that just went missing during the war. Uh, that would go on for, for decades after the war. Uh, I can only imagine uh, the kind of hell that uh, family members went through uh, waiting to hear you know, whether their loved ones had survived you know, a battle. And, the, and this went on for you know, four long years. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this little presentation. Uh, it's uh, just... Uh, thought it was important to try and put a human face on, uh, on the, the casualties for one battle. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, give it a, a, a like uh, and, and leave a comment if you, if you would care to. I'd love to hear them. Uh, but I uh, hope you enjoyed this talk. I'll be coming back very soon with another uh, presentation. But uh, thank you very much and uh, I look forward to seeing you again.